Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, welcome to Likeness of Sinful Flesh, Part 2. Um, we're going to be talking about how Satan tried to get Jesus, who's in the likeness of sinful flesh, a corruptible body. He was never corrupted, never sinned, tried to get him to sin. Okay, So let's go ahead and reread uh, Romans 8.1. And turn to Romans 8.1. I'll try to turn to some of these with you if it starts getting long. The biggest thing about my notes is I have things circled, I have things underlined to remind me to talk about certain points. Romans 8.1. There, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. We talked about in the first study that Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh, so that was how He was able to die on the cross and become sin who knew no sin. Okay. But right now, what we're going to be talking about, you go, uh, if you want to turn to Isaiah 7.12, I realize there's a lot of pages. So I got my Bible here to look up stuff, but please have your King James Bibles out. I'm a King James Bible believer, and turn and follow along. So turn to Isaiah 7, chapter 7, verse 12. This is where we get the best definition of what it means by likeness of sinful flesh when it applies to Jesus Christ being in the likeness of sinful flesh. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David. It is a small thing for you to weary men, but will ye weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and to choose the good. But before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. And I like prophecy, and we see it happen. Um, when Jesus came and was born in the likeness of sinful flesh, uh, there's 12 tribes of Israel. 11 tribes had a king after Solomon, uh, and the tribe of Judah had a king. So there was two kings. That's why it says kings plural there, I believe. And were those two kings forsaken? Who was in charge at that time period? Uh, Caesar, the Roman Empire. Okay. But what we see there, to choose, to refuse the evil and choose the good. Jesus did what we couldn't do. He always chose the good and he refused the evil. There's times in your life, brothers and sisters in Christ, that we choose the good over the evil. And there's times where we fall into temptation and we choose the evil over the good. We're sinners. We have sinned. We have a corruptible body that we talked about in the first part. So the second part I want to talk about is Jesus being tempted by Satan. This will be part two. Okay. We're going to talk about examples of Jesus choosing good over evil, and he was trying he was being tempted and he was trying to be deceived. Okay? But you're talking about Jesus Christ as God, the Father, manifest in the flesh. He's God fully and completely. Okay. So turn to Matthew 4, chapter 4, verse 1. Okay. This one I can turn to. Because this pretty much goes through all of them. But we're going to be jumping around. So make sure to keep your place here. Matthew 4, 1. Okay. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, and when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward a hungered. Now I'm going to stop there. Okay. We're going to talk about this. A lot of people think that the likeness of sinful flesh means that he just got hungry and he got tired and he could feel pain. Pain is part of it. Okay. I understand that. I understand being hungry, he's in a, a body that is deteriorating, he grows old. Okay. 
So let's go through some passages that show that he's eating and he's sleeping. Because there's something you got to understand when it comes to the eating part. Okay. Luke 8.22. If you want to turn to Luke 8.22. Keep your place there in Matthew for this whole study. But Luke 8.22. Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples and said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and there, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him and said, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. So we read here that Jesus slept. Okay. And so I just wanted to read that part that it's just not my words. It's in the Bible. It shows that Jesus slept. Okay. He got tired and he fell asleep. Luke 24, uh, 36. My whole point is, is that's part of it, but the likeness of sinful flesh is talking about sin. Remember when sin into the world, death into the world? Uh, people started to age. People started to get old. Okay. You got tired. Okay. That's part of it. But to understand that the, the whole point of why that's in the world is because of sin. Luke 24, 36. If you want to turn to Luke 24, 36. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. This is after the resurrection when he's got his glorified body. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do ye thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself handle me and see for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. That, that right there is a big verse that debunks the God and three persons with the Trinity. Okay, A person, by definition in the King James Bible, has a body and a soul and a spirit. Okay, You can be referring to somebody in the past as a person that was alive even though they're dead now, but you're referring to them when they were alive. They have to have a body, soul, and spirit to be a person. So the Holy Spirit is not a person. Because right here, this is Jesus saying, a um, spirit hath not flesh and bones. A little sidetrack there. But let's keep reading. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of a honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. This is him in his glorified body. He's eating. So is the fact that he can eat, is that what it means by likeness of sinful flesh? I don't believe that's what it means, likeness of sinful flesh. It means that he's in a flesh that's corruptible. He can be tempted. And he was. We're going to be talking about this as we get further. Okay. Now, was this just in the Old Testament? I mean, the New Testament where he's got his glorified body. Did he eat in the Old Testament when he had his incorruptible body in the Old Testament? Okay, turn to Genesis 18.1. We're going to start there. It's going to be a long one, but we're going to start just getting context. Genesis 18.1. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day, and he lifted up his eyes and took and looked, sorry, and lo, three men stood by him, and when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself towards the ground. And said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts, also that ye shall pass on. For therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. Now I'm going to stop there for a second. Because I forgot to mention, when we first started reading it, Genesis 18.1, it says, And the Lord appeared. You can see flesh. Okay, you cannot see the Spirit. We've already just got talked about that. Jesus is talking about that in the New Testament. So this is Jesus Christ. Remember, there's but one God, the Father, capital G, God the Father, and one Lord, capital L, Lord, Jesus Christ. And I've said this in other things. When you see Lord in all capital letters, I believe it's referring to Jesus Christ, who is God. Okay. They're interchangeable, I understand, that, as titles, but I still believe it's Jesus Christ. Why? Because it said it appeared. 
God the Father, the soul, doesn't have a physical body you can see. And this is a whole other study, but Jesus is the expressed image of God. Image is something you can see. Okay. It appeared, the Lord appeared to him. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the earth. And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. Okay. Now I believe what's talking about when it talks about um, these men, you have Jesus and you have two angels, the two angels that went into Sodom and Gomorrah, and Jesus stayed up there and started talking with uh, Abraham, where he starts saying uh, the whole thing about peradventure there's a hundred righteous men. It gets all the way down to ten, I think it is. Uh, but that's who's there. So we see that even in an incorruptible body, he ate. Right? The angels that were, what I have talked about in the last day, they're incorruptible bodies because a third of the angels are tempted by Satan and follow him. Okay? If you're in an incorruptible body, you're not capable of being corrupted. That's what incorruptible means. Corruptible just means you're capable of being corrupted. It doesn't mean you are corrupted. It means you're capable of it. Okay? So, is this, can we use this as the baseline, as a definition of what it means to come in the likeness of sinful flesh? I'm just reiterating this because we already talked about this in the first study. But since it came up about him being hungry, I wanted to go through and talk about it to say, hey. Okay. Um, another person, a uh, corruptible uh, body, but yet he had never sinned. Okay. So if you turn to Genesis 2.9, we're going to talk about Adam again. We're going to go back to Adam and Eve. Okay. And we talked about this, I see. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2.16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat every tree. But the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. I brought this up because they still had to eat the tree of life to live. They just they weren't sustained by themselves. When we get our incorruptible body, we're sustained by Jesus Christ. Okay, we don't have to eat the tree of life. Okay, from the tree of life. Um, so I just wanted to bring that out. There's eating on both sides, incorruptible and corruptible. So is that what it means to be like in the likeness of sinful flesh? I don't believe it is. Truly being in the likeness of sinful flesh means that you're corruptible. Not that you're corrupted. Adam and Eve were not corrupted until they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Before that, they were, they were not corrupted at all. Okay? They were perfect. Um, so go back to Matthew chapter 4, we're on verse 3. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Satan's tempting Jesus Christ. Right. Remember, he hungered. He was hungry. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Right. There's times, let's see. Did you know, I'll ask this question, did you know that when... Um, you don't take care of yourself physically and spiritually. That's when you seem to get tempted the most. If you don't get regular sleep, if you're not eating right, if you're not staying in the Word of God, that's when you can get tempted the most. When you're physically weak, spiritually weak, that's when Satan's going to come in and, and attack you and tempt you. That's when your flesh is going to tempt you. Okay. Now, remember it said that man shall not live by bread alone. He's not saying you're not supposed to eat, but you're not to be flesh-driven. Your flesh isn't supposed to run you. Okay? 1 Corinthians 6.18, you're talking about your body. Okay? Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sin against his own body. What? Know ye not that, the, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with the price... Therefore glorify your body, 
glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You're to glorify God in your body and in your spirit, staying in the Word of God, right? believing in it and having faith in it, right? living by it. That's when it comes to the flesh. The outward showing is that you're living by this Bible. It gives you commands. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Okay? A workman that needeth not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay? So we got the physical side and we got the physical side. Or the spiritual side. Okay, And the spiritual side is going to come out on the physical side. That's why there's evidence. That's why the Bible says prove your own selves. We're to prove we're Christians by the life we live and we're living for Jesus Christ. Okay? We're not to live by bread alone. We're not to be flesh driven though. Okay? Ephesians 5.27 Another thing about your body that he may present it and your spirit that he may present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish right you're supposed to take care of yourself physically and spiritually and how does one do this man shall not live by bread alone but by every word but, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of god you have john 17 17 that we know brothers and sisters in christ sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth we're sanctified through his word and if you get away from his word you're going to start falling into sin and temptation i I've done it before. I've put God's word to the side before. Okay. You don't do that. And what I'm talking about is when you fall into sin and temptation, sin tends to pull you away from God's word. And then you don't start taking care of yourself physically. All right. First John 1 John 1.19, if we confess our sins... Oh, no, I jumped ahead. I'm sorry. Psalms 119.9, another reason, way of how do we sanctify and glorify God in our bodies and in our spirits. That's why Jesus said, not bread alone, we can eat. That's why he said you won't live by bread alone, but by every word that uh, proceedeth from the mouth of God. Psalms 119, 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? Okay. When we fail, I want to throw this in. When we fail, okay, we fall into temptation. We're not glorifying God with our body or with our spirit. Uh, 1 John 1 19 is what you need to remember. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, right, uh, failed to glory, I always stop there saying, fail to glorify God in our bodies and spiritually, because when you fail to glorify God spiritually, it's going to reflect physically, right? We make him a liar and his word is not in us. Talked about this in the last study. I have a corrupted body. Not corruptible. It was corruptible when I was born, but we talked about we're born and almost immediately we are corrupted. Right. We're born, uh, I don't have the verse on me, we're born lying, basically. Um, it's in Psalms. But uh, remember, if we say, like people say, well, now that I'm saved, I'm sinless. Okay. Uh, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. We're not to live by bread alone, but by every word. So Satan is tempting Jesus. Have we failed that temptation? Absolutely. And as you read through this, and we're going through this, guess what? Satan failed that one. Big time. He went against God and his word. And he still does to this day. So as we see here, Jesus tempted into choosing his flesh over his word to be fleshly. That's the whole point about saying, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Jesus is saying, I won't be fleshly. Nice try. I will not choose evil over good. He was walking. It goes back to the, what we talked about in our study about, um, Let's see if I can get this out. Uh, can a Christian be carnal? We're talking about how when we're lost, we're walking after the flesh. We're carnally minded and walking after the flesh. And that's how we're born. And when we get saved, we become spiritually minded and we walk after the spirit. Right. Jesus was born um, 
spiritually minded and walking after the spirit. He was never carnally minded walking after the flesh. And that's the whole temptation here is to get him to be fleshly. So Matthew 4, 5, the next temptation. Then the devil taketh him up into a holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. How many times as we read and that they're asking Jesus for proof? Show us that you're 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 Jesus, that you're the the Messiah, okay, the Christ. Prove, prove it, prove it. Give us a sign. Give us a sign. Okay? You don't tempt the Lord. He's not going to tempt the Lord thy God. If you turn to Matthew chapter twenty six fifty one, you also see he had to die a death on the cross. That he's not going to tempt God, but there's a reason for it. Okay. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? Would we read up there? His angels charge concerning thee to protect Jesus Christ? But now then shall the scriptures be fulfilled, that thus it may be. Okay? When you go back to that, people think, well, the tempting is he's just you know, tempting with his life. And there's instruction in righteousness there. Okay? But I think, what more than anything, that this reflects with what we just read right there. Tempting God to save you. He's like, no, I could have angels come save me, but I have to die a death. Right. The scriptures must be fulfilled. Right. Once again, he's getting Jesus to go against the word of God. He's trying to tempt him. Right. Now people today, uh, if you've watched, people today put themselves in physical harm. So let's talk about that side of it. They like to put themselves in physical harm. Okay, they, they're, A lot of people call them uh, adrenaline junkies, where they're always putting their lives in harm's way, thinking it's fun. Um, people today will put their lives in harm's way um, and then have the attitude of, nah, God will save me. And uh, oftentimes, given into sin and everything, like we just talked about, sin oftentimes reflects on your physical, your actions, your health, when you're falling into sin and temptation. So you've got people that'll just sin and sin and sin, and they're killing themselves, alcoholics, drug addicts, uh, eyes, like all the years I played video games and watched movies and TV shows, I, I believe that's a number one reason why I have to wear glasses today. Right. So there's things that we can do, we can fall into sin and temptation. Um, people can fornicate and you can get all kinds of diseases. Right. Um, there's physical consequences oftentimes to the sins that we commit. Sometimes God will forgive us but there's times where the consequences are still there. And we tempt God. A lot of these uh, professing Christians that will just tempt God and say, well, I, I can sin. You know, God will forgive me. And what does the Bible say about that in Romans chapter 6, verse 1? We've read this lots of times in a lot of studies. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. They're tempting God. Those who believe that they can sin that grace may abound. They're tempting God. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us that were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him in his baptism and death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Okay. Jesus was being tempted to take no regard for his body. Once again, it goes back to the flesh. and uh, He was... Uh, he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Right? He was corruptible, but he was never corrupted. He was being tempted. Right? Today, we see a lot of people today that are tempted by that. Well, you know, I could do it. God will forgive me later. It's, it's no big deal. 
And a lot of people get so disappointed because it's like, I get saved and now why isn't God healing me and taking all these problems out of my life? They should just disappear like that, right? Uh, no, there's still consequences. That's why the Bible says, if you live by the flesh, you shall die. That's for saved and lost. Right? There's still consequences for your actions when you've lived by the flesh. Okay. Uh, go back to Matthew chapter 4, verse 8. So we see Jesus being tempted again by Satan. All Satan has to do is get him to sin. He's not, Je he's not God manifest in the flesh. He's not God the Father come in the flesh in the likeness of sinful flesh. Mm -hmm. The body, okay, body, soul, and spirit, real quick, Godhead. The body, soul, and spirit. Soul, God the Father, body, Jesus Christ, spirit, Holy Spirit. Okay. Jesus is the one you can see. He's got a body. Matthew 4, 8. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and said unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now he's tempting Jesus with the world. This is the number one. I mean, you go through all these. Satan is still using these three temptations that he's tempting Jesus with on the world, on everybody that's in the world. Okay. Exodus 34, 14, uh, For thou shalt worship no other gods, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Now two things that Jesus says there, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. We're to worship Jesus Christ and serve him. Spirit, flesh, and body. Okay. They go hand in hand. So let's talk about the worship and the serving uh, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Now, before I forget, I want to go back. Remember what it said up there that uh, when he was trying to tempt him with his life, when he said, hey, just, you know, tempt the Lord and throw your life down. He said that when it came to the angels, he could have a thousand angels coming to get him, and he said, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He was going to fulfill scripture. Satan was going to get him to stop. Man wasn't going to get him to stop. Okay. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 we read. Mm -hmm. Whatsoever you drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Physically, you need to be giving God glory in how you live your life. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 5.20 um, Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to give thanks in all things. Okay. This is spiritual. We're supposed to have a heartfelt conviction to say, I don't deserve this. Thank you, Lord, for everything you've done for me. Okay. You don't have, he didn't have to do it. God chose to do it because He has grace for us and He has love for us. Colossians 3.17 And whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Okay. Word or deed, spirit, flesh. We're to give God glory. We're to do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and serve Him only. Jesus was being tempted. Look at all this stuff. Uh, you want a car? You want riches? You want the world? You want to be able to play video games, watch Hollywood movies, TV shows, drink, smoke? You want all this stuff? You can have it. Just worship me. That's what Satan's saying. And how many people have fallen for this? I was a false convert for a long time. I fell for that where I could be saved and I could have the world. Right. People, Satan's been using the same thing on everybody. Same temptation. But who was the only person that wasn't tempted and fell for it? Jesus Christ. He was in the likeness of sinful flesh, corruptible body, but he was never corrupted. He never sinned. Remember? He became sin who knew no sin. 
He never sinned. John 14, 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Okay? Loving Jesus, worshiping Jesus, loving Jesus is keeping his word. It's not a feeling that you have deep inside, and it's a feeling, and you go to these Babel buildings, and you get caught up in the emotions, and raving your hands and everything. That's not loving Jesus. Loving Jesus, serving him, is keeping his perfect written word. You do your best. And remember, when you fail, he is faithful to forgive us. When you drop your cross, you're supposed to deny yourself, that's repenting, pick up your cross, forsaking, and follow Jesus Christ. Continue where you left off with the Lord. Okay. When you fail him. But loving Jesus, my love for Jesus, is I'm doing my best to stand for this book and live it. Obey it. Mm -hmm. John 15, 13. Here's another one where people don't like to read the whole context. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. They leave out 14. They don't want to read 14. If, it's a Bible if, you do whatsoever I command you. You want to be the friend of Jesus? Are you doing your best to do whatsoever he commands you? We talked about him. Staying from all appearance of evil. Study to show thyself approved. Right? Be not conformed to this world. And so on and so on. Tons of instruction and righteousness on how we're the do's and the don'ts. Pardon me. Right? And Jesus, like I said, we read, he was faithful to the scriptures. Okay, that the scriptures should be fulfilled to the word of his word. He was faithful to his word. He didn't lie. He didn't go back down on his word. Okay. You know how some people say, I'm the example. You see this in a lot of religions where the higher-ups, it's okay for them to go against their word and break their word because they're the, exam the exemption. You know, uh, Jesus wasn't like that. I... Now, we're going to talk a little bit about people who don't want to worship the Lord thy God and serve Him only. And why? Okay, Philippians 3.18. This is where they failed. And I failed at one time. They failed. Right? They failed that temptation. Jesus didn't, but they did. Did uh, Satan fail that same temptation? Oh yeah, he wants to be like the Most High. He, he counterfeits Jesus Christ because he wants to be worshipped as God. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, because they're not worshiping the Lord their God and serving Him only. So their God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Okay? They're not worshiping the Lord, they're worshiping the flesh. Okay? And they're not serving the Lord, they're serving Satan. Okay? They mind earthly things. Who's the lowercase g God of this world? Satan. And what did Satan offer Jesus Christ? The world. And would Jesus say, uh, no, I'm sticking to my word and obeying what I told everybody else to obey. Right. Uh, Romans 12, 2 talks about, and be not conformed. When it said, mind earthly things, what does Satan do? We talked about this before, but I love talking about God's word. So we'll, we'll go through it again. Romans 12, 2. Right. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When you are worshiping Jesus Christ and serving Him only, you're going to be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Why? Because you won't conform to this world. You're saying, Satan, I don't want this world. Lord Jesus Christ, you know, Satan, get thee hence. Uh... Jesus, get him out of my the temptation and uh, everything out. Lord, I don't want this world. Right? I want you. Right? You won't conform to this world when you love the Lord and you're his friend. We talked about those two. And um, you're not conforming to the world. You're just saying, I don't want the world. 1 John 2.15 also says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The love it's talking about there is the way of the world. Okay, um, I can love 
I love going for walks on the beach and hunting down sea glass and agates. That's my one of my hobbies that I love. And I can love it. That's just fine. I'm not to love the way of the world. When you start falling into loving the way of the world, uh, you know, women can dress like men. Women can have short hair. Men, you don't have to provide for your own. And men can start dressing feminine. And, and, and you can go on the satanic style music, the movies, the drinking. And I can go on and on. The world's way of doing things, what you're doing is you're loving the world more than you love Jesus Christ. And you're choosing the world over Jesus Christ. Okay? That's what it means by loving not the world. Jesus was being tempted. Okay? You're not to do that. You're not to love the world. Jesus, remember, Jesus chose the good over the evil. James 4, 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Satan is the enemy. He's the ultimate enemy. If you're a friend of the world, you're a friend of Satan. You cannot be a friend of Satan and a friend of God. Jesus Christ, okay? It's one or the other. I use this verse, and a lot of people hate it, to show that this proves that I can use this verse to look at someone who professes to be saved. Do they look like the world, act like the world, laugh at the world's jokes? Do they look at the world and love the world? To conform to the world? Doing things the world's way and trying to integrate Christianity into the world? You can be a Christian and have the world too? Uh, they're the enemies of Christ. Okay? The enemy of God. They're not saved. This is one of the good verses you can use uh, to judge yourself by and the lost world. Lord, am I conforming to this world? In any aspect of my life, am I falling into loving the world more than you? Not loving the way of the world, but loving anything that's more than you or falling into loving the world when I'm supposed to be loving you, doing things the way the world's doing them, right? and not abiding by your word. Okay? So people are being told that you can be a Christian and have the world. Okay? Satan was trying to tempt Jesus. Uh, you can have the world, and, and you can you know you can still be God, but you just worship me. Okay. Uh, no, it doesn't work that way. Now, to wrap this uh, this one up real quick, Jesus chose good over evil. You know what it means to say, "Take the world and give me Jesus." Uh, Right now, people, there's a song out there that I was looking at, and I mentioned this before, where it's, take the world, but give me Jesus. All right? And when I was watching that video, the girl, uh, it starts out, I mean, she's dressed like a man. She's wearing pants. That's the world. But she's saying, take the world, but she's like doing things the way of the world. And it starts out okay, and uh, kind of. She, she's dressed in pants, okay. And as you get halfway through the song, it starts turning into rock music, satanic style music, the world's way of doing things. So what's going on there? It's deception and lies. She's really saying, give me the world, take Jesus, I want the world. I want to be a Christian and have the world. So, now Jesus, he was tempted, but what is Jesus? John 16, 33, these things have I spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You know, people, uh, the world, they speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. If you're not conformed to this world, you're going to have tribulation as a Christian in this life. Uh, friends, you're going to lose friends. Family members are going to turn against you. The way the world looks at you, you're going to have harder times trying to live your life. Because a lot of people say, well, what am I supposed to do then? What am I supposed to do then? We, we call them out for recently Christmas, okay? My sons want, my kids want gifts, and they love the tree, and they love the lights. What am I supposed to do? It's going to be hard to stand out and say, hey, I want nothing to do with that, okay? Easter, I want nothing to do with Easter. A bunch of my friends are going out to get drunk. I don't want to be part of that anymore. God has saved me and changed my life. I'm not going to do that. They're going to start looking at you differently. Trying to eat healthy today is hard in America because uh, the powers that be that God put in charge, remember who's the lowercase g God of this world, and Jesus still has to report to, I mean, Jesus, God, uh, Satan still has to report to Jesus. 
but they're trying to poison America. So eating healthy today is hard and sometimes it's expensive. Okay, and they've done that purposely. And you're going to have tribulation in this life because you don't conform to the world. But remember, it says Jesus overcame the world. I have overcome the world. He chose good over evil. He wasn't tempted by Satan. Okay. Philippians 3, 7. Okay. But what does it mean to choose Jesus Christ over the world to say, take the world, what it truly means. And in that song, I didn't hear it, I didn't watch the, uh, all the words, but they really didn't talk about God's word that much. Um, when it, what does it truly mean to say, take the world and give me Jesus? Well, Paul writes in Philippians 3, 7, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. His lost life. He chose the world. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung. Why? That I may win Christ. When you come broken before Jesus Christ, you're saying, I don't want anything to do with the world, the way of the world anymore. Okay? I don't want that stuff anymore. I could have all this stuff that seems great, riches, whatever. That's all dung. Right? That I may win Jesus Christ. The world wants to do things this way. God's word says we're supposed to do things that way. World this way, that way. Which one are you going to choose? Well, as a Christian, we choose that way. God's way. Okay, That's what it means. And I watched that video, and it's like, that's not what I saw there. I saw worldliness. They're still looking like the world and the world's satanic-style music right? that elevates the flesh. So we read there, Satan was tempting Jesus. Why was he tempting? If Jesus was in an incorruptible body, he's not capable. Satan didn't tempt Jesus in the Old Testament. Why is it all of a sudden now Satan's tempting Jesus? Because he's in a corruptible body. He's came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Right? Doesn't mean he wasn't there in the Old Testament. Doesn't mean that he's a sinner. It just means that since he's in that flesh, Satan's trying to get him to sin. If he gets him to sin, then he's not God. I'll throw this out there. Uh, might do it in a, one of these parts if I add it to it later, but... These Bible perversions, what are they about? They're about tearing Jesus down, and they make Jesus out to be a sinner in these Bible perversions. Okay. Uh, one of them makes him out to be a liar. It's all about trying to get Jesus to sin or to, or to deceive the world that Jesus is a sinner. Okay, If it's true, then he's not God. If he had sinned, he wouldn't be able to accomplish the scriptures on the cross. He couldn't be able to become sin who knew no sin because he would have known sin. If he's a sinner and he's not so here's Satan trying to tempt him remember the likeness of sinful flesh a corruptible body that corruptible means capable of being corrupted doesn't mean that he is corrupted I am corrupted I have a corruptible body okay and I have been corrupted in other words I'm a sinner and we read this in the uh, first study on someday God will get rid of this corrupted body and give us an incorruptible body okay? Where we won't be capable of sin, and we don't have to worry, our bodies won't be tempting us anymore. So we're going to move on to the second part, which, where Jesus is tempted by man. So, grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, and my love for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching. P.S. Remember, Satan was guilty of all that stuff he was tempting Jesus with. He always likes to copy Jesus, and he wanted to tear Jesus down to his level. Okay, remember that, because we're going to be talking about that in the next study. Right? How man is doing the same thing to this day. So thank you for watching.